worst that could possibly happen to us that is beyond your power to love and support us, to help us and show us the way. We thank you that in every way you show your gifts on us, from all that we have and seen, and how, you know, how we can not be amazed and thankful. Um, Amen. And of confession. Lord God, we're happy to adore, to praise, and to thank you for all that you are and all that we know you to be. But we must face up to it when it comes to actually following your way and all that you want us to do in and with our lives for you and the coming of your kingdom, we are not all that we should be. It's easy to pull, to make do with the least in effort of all, to find the excuse of why we should have bothered. And this we do constantly, Lord. And when we think of this situation, we have to say, we are sorry. So, keep showing us the way, taking us by the hand, making us stronger in commitment to you and your will for each of us. We thank you that we can come before you in repentance and be assured of your pardon, your forgiveness and your guidance. What a joy, what a comfort, what a privilege is the assurance of your love for and patience with us in our spiritual journeys. Praise be to you, O Lord our God. Amen. Amen. And now to bring all these prayers again to our minds we pray together using the words of the Lord's Prayer, which are on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, Away. 
And he thought, if I don't use the best materials, and if I take a few shortcuts, I'll be able to save some money. But I won't save the money for the builder, for the, for the man who wants it built, sorry. I'll keep it for myself. So that's what he decided to do. Do you think that was a good thing to do? No, I don't either. But that's what he did. So, he dug the foundations. When you build a house, you don't start building it, first of all. You go down, first of all, to make sure it's strong underneath. So he made sure all the foundations got dug. Yeah. And he started to build them. There we go, he's building them. But they weren't quite as deep or as strong as maybe they should have been. For anyone who's done an extension, I don't know where the building officer came into this story. But there we go. <laughs> but they weren't quite as deep or as strong as they should have been. But they look okay, don't they? I think they look okay. I think they look okay. He built the walls. So we've got the walls. But he didn't take too much care about how he did the brickwork. So we should have a, cop a little look now at a picture of the nice bricks on the outside and look at those on the inside. They're a bit of a mess, aren't they? The one on the left hand side, but those were the ones you didn't see. So he wasn't bothered about that, was he? He was only about, bothered about the ones that you could see. Anyway, he then put the roof on. And it looked pretty good. But he knew that it wasn't quite as good as he could have done it. And it definitely keep the rain out for a few years, but maybe not for many years. Anyway, it looks all right, doesn't it, the house? So, the rich man returned and asked him to build this house. And he was quite impressed. He said, you know what? That looks really good. But now something really funny happened. He went up to the builder and he said, I'm really pleased with the house. And I'm so glad that you spent as much money as you wanted on it. And I'm so glad that you take so much care of building it. Because it's for you. <laughs> because you've worked so hard for me in the past. This is my gift for you. And he got the keys and he gave them to the builder. Look, he's taking the keys. What do you think he thought then? Do you think he was happy then? What would he have done if he'd known the house was for him? He would have made it the very best he can, but you know, he knew that because those foundations weren't right, in a few years' time, he was going to have all sorts of problems. He might get cracks in the walls, and he might even get a leaky roof. And it was his house. Now, what do you think that teaches us? What do you think we can learn from what the builder said, what, what the builder did? I think what it teaches us is that we should always do the best that we can, whether it's for ourselves or for someone else, isn't it? And perhaps we think sometimes, oh, I'll do a really quick job and I'll not really bother. And it's teaching us really that God sees everything. That's the message of this story. And we should always do our best. So when you're in school, always do your best and think about what you want to be in the future. That's important, isn't it? What you want to grow up to be, what good people you want to be, and what good jobs you want to do, and how you want to help other people. So we've got to remember to always do our best. And the song that we're going to sing now reminds us of that. It's reminding us that everything we do... Every day of the week, not just on Sundays, we should remember that God's with us and we should live our lives as God wants us to do. So we'll go back and we'll sing again now. We'll sing one more step along the world I go.
that we may mark it weak. It is on this scale. Buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings with the wheat. The Lord has sworn by himself the pride of Jacob. I will never forget anything they have done. Amen. Sing again hymn number 664. Lord, you call us to your service. Their houses. 
So he called each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? Nine hundred gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The reading set for today follow on from what you were thinking about last week at your harvest, which I'm led to believe focused on caring for and using our resources for the benefit of all. Blue Planet, narrated by uh, David Attenborough, shone the spotlight, didn't it, on the use of plastic, and things seem to have gone on a roller coaster since then. I'm certainly not a shopper. Um, I go to town when I have to. But last week we were away and we were, we were doing a bit of a tour. Uh, I've recently become a grandma for the first time and my granddaughter lives near Wimbledon. So we decided we'd do a couple of days in the Cotswolds, um, Mitchell near Wimbledon to see <coughs> Abby. And then, and of course my son and the daughter in law, we sort of forget that, don't you, when you're a grandparent, I think. But I'm beginning to learn things. Uh, and then we called at Cambridge on the way back. And we went into Cambridge and it was noticeable how many shops had signs in the window offering to refill your water bottle. And I thought, yes, times really have changed, haven't they? Greta Thunberg, the young Swedish climate activist, has inspired young people and growingly old people as well. And I know Katrina spoke last week quite a bit about how she's become involved in the movement to prevent really or reduce climate change. And she was at the rally in Manchester on Saturday. So I thought it might be quite nice and interesting for you to have heard the before and you can now hear the after. So just for a few minutes, Katrina's going to share with us what happened in Manchester. I think it was Friday, wasn't it? Not Saturday, I think it was Friday. But Katrina's going to do that now, I think. There. So, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for their kind word and support after last week, and for those who were unable to make it on Friday for their thoughts and prayers, because it really did seem to make a massive difference. We had around 4,000 in Manchester and over 4 million across the world who were speaking up for the future of the planet. And it really did seem like a tipping point in terms of media coverage, the amount of people who were there and the passion of all those involved. And we seem to start to touch base with the people who can make a difference. So I'd like to thank everybody and everybody involved across the world because we are starting to make a difference and we're getting ground back, so thank you. It was a pretty amazing experience with all those people there. It was overwhelming and you could feel it in the air that it did feel like a tipping point. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Katrina. Each of us has to make our own decisions. 
about plastic usage and energy conservation, the type of cars we buy, and the transport we use. And of course, we have to ask ourselves how much extra we're willing to pay for fairly traded goods or ones that have been produced without damaging the environment. Those are our own decisions to make. The reading we heard from Amos focuses on the need for fair trading. And it's considering the local scene in that particular time. But for us now, the considerations are far more global, aren't they? During the Amazonian tropical dry season this year, we've seen all those photographs of the forest fires. Some are accidental and some are deliberate, as Brazilian farmers need more land, they burn the trees. And the press kept saying something along the lines of, Brazil's got to stop this. They have a responsibility for providing the world with oxygen. And I got to thinking, why? Why should the Brazilian farmers support our wealthy lifestyle in the West? And it just got me thinking, you know, we're quite willing to pay for water, gas and electricity. Should we actually be paying some sort of quota for our oxygen, if we're expecting someone on the other side of the world not to farm because we need the trees. But it was just a thought. In the reading that we heard from Paul's letter to Timothy, we're reminded that all the decisions that we make, be it on climate change or our daily actions, all our decisions should be based on faith the faith that we hold. All our dealings with other people should be based on our relationship with God and his relationship with us. Paul urges the people, first of all, before you do anything else, before you go out and do your good works or help someone else, first of all, make petitions, prayers, intercession and thanksgiving for all people including kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness. As our country faces unique decisions in the weeks ahead, all we can really do is pray. And I think we need to pray that the decisions that are made are for the good of all and not for individual gain. So we need to pray for our politicians that they will get their priorities right. As we approach October 31st, as we're reminded every time we drive down the motorway now, there's signs everywhere saying your papers may be different for anyone importing goods after October the 31st or November the 1st, depending on which motorway you're on, it varies. But we need to pray for those in authority. We need to pray for those who might be tempted to violent protests, depending which way the decision goes. We need to pray for those who are fearful, those maybe who run a business. I think it can be quite easy to be blasé, and I can fall into that category, and I say, well, you know, when I was growing up, we had strawberries when they were in season. And it made strawberries more special, actually, because there was only a certain time of year where you could get them. So what if we don't get quite the variety of fruit or veg? Does it really matter? But you know, there are people who need a particular drug. And some drugs in this country are already in short supply. Those people will be fearful. We need to pray for them and think about those people. We need to pray for any who depend on social care because that might be an area where things become quite difficult. Some people would argue that politics and religion don't mix. And I certainly wouldn't stand up here and promote a certain action or a certain political party. But religion is our lives and politics are our lives. And the two do mix. We need to pray that the right decisions are made. 
We need to pray for integrity for all those involved. And so we come to that passage that we heard from Luke's Gospel, which taught very much about integrity, the parable of the shrewd manager. I think it's one of the most difficult parables to understand. It raises all sorts of questions. And that's the reason, the reason that I'm talking about the parable this morning is because as preachers we have the discipline of lectionary that advises, it doesn't tell us we have to, but it advises certain passages that we use from the Bible each Sunday. And it's to encourage local preachers and ministers not to take the easy way out really. Because it's so easy to preach on passages that you're comfortable with. So this morning we're going to look at that parable and we're going to discover what it might be saying to us together. We need to look back a little bit at the main themes that have come before the parable so that we can put it into context. And before this, the reading that we heard this morning, we had the parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Very much about sinners coming to repentance and God accepted them back, looking for the one that is lost. And wealth too is an important topic in Luke 16. And the parable of the shrewd manager centres around this steward who is accused of wasting his master's good. This may be down to mismanagement. It might be down to downright dishonesty. We don't really know and there's people who argue for both of these options. But whichever it is, the steward's about to be dismissed. He can't be trusted. He's going to be dismissed. So he's facing unemployment, he's only ever been a steward, he doesn't really have any other skills, he doesn't fancy manual labour, and so he's got a bit of a dilemma on his hands. And he decides that he needs to get into his neighbour's good favour, so when he falls on hard times, they'll be willing to look after him. And this is where I have a little bit of a problem. The steward reduces his neighbour's bills to get in their good books. And so I think you have to ask yourself, but at whose expense? Is he simply lowering the price and taking even more profit away from his boss? Is he removing some sort of extortionate interest that the master was charging in the first place? A bit of a Robin Hood thing going on there, I think. But again, is he not just robbing the master? Or as some people suggest, is he simply removing what was his own commission and therefore investing in his future? I like the third scenario. It sort of fits better for me that he's taking away his own commission but actually, I don't think we'll ever know what was meant by that. What we do need to remember about this parable is that unlike most of Jesus' parables, we don't have someone who represents God, Christ, or a positive character that we should be emulating. In this parable, it's not the behaviour of the characters that's important. It's a spiritual principle that Jesus is trying to teach us. And it's continuing that theme of preparedness for God's kingdom. The manager commends the steward for his action in looking to the future, in investing in the future. Even though he's done things wrong in the past, he's misused resources that were given to him for investment, he's now thinking about the future and making long-term plans. And in his analysis of the story, Jesus says, 
For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. He's comparing the attitude of the unbelievers and the attitude of the believers. Perhaps he's thinking particularly about the priests and the Pharisees who were more interested in lining their own pockets than leading the people in faith. And today I think it could still be argued that very worldly people are more focused on storing up worldly treasures, on making more money, than the average Christian is focused on storing up treasures for heaven. You do get those people, don't you, who are absolutely focused on getting more and more and acquiring more and more. That's how we should feel about our faith. Getting to know God more and more, spending more and more time with him, with that definite focus. Jesus wants us to grow spiritually. He wants us to look to a future with him. He wants us to make sure that the people that we meet can have that wealth that we get from faith that we appreciate so much. Matthew 6 tells us, don't store up treasure for yourselves on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The principle Jesus is trying to teach us is that everything we own should be used to further God's kingdom. We are God's stewards. Just as the un just steward in the parable was shrewd in benefiting himself materially, we should be shrewd in benefiting ourselves and others in a spiritual sense. We are to use everything that we've been given. And when we talk about resources, we tend to think about money. But no, we're to use everything that we've been given our gifts, our talents, our freedom to further God's goals. In Matthew 6, we were told no one can serve two masters, will either hate one and love the other, or will be devoted to one and despise the other. We cannot serve both God and money. This doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with having money. This doesn't mean that it's wrong to sensibly prepare for your retirement. We're not expected to give all our money away and live in poverty. But we are required to remember that everything that we have is a gift. Life, health, family, abilities, energy, strength, possessions, and yes, money. That is a gift from God. And with that comes responsibility. We believe that we're saved by grace and not by works. And it's important to remember that when you read this parable, which at times seems to imply that we can be saved by what we do and not by what Jesus did freely for us. We're saved by grace, that's a free gift given to us by Jesus' death on the cross. But true faith, being given such a wonderful gift of eternal life, will change our priorities. It will change our focus and it will change our behaviour. 
The closer we get to God, the more time we spend with him and in his service, the more we will benefit. Gaining things that money can't buy. Perfect guidance and perfect peace, even in the most challenging of circumstances. <coughs> the closer we get to God, the more we will be able to share the good news with those people that we meet. The guidance and the peace that we so much value. I'm going to read a few more verses from Matthew chapter 6, which starts with no one can serve two masters, either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, or reap, or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worry, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They don't labour or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendour was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The messages in that passage to me, there's lots of them, and I'm sure there are to you too. We're at the beginning of a new church year. And I challenge us all to determine our focus. We need to think about where our focus will be which Bible study or house group we could maybe attend, or maybe even start to run. We need to commit our resources and our lives again to God's service. We need to consider where our real priorities lie, and in fact whether these should change. Amen. Amen. We sing again hymn number 661. Give me the faith that can remove or sink a mountain to a plane. Hymn number 661.
We come to you today asking prayers for our world. We are living through a crisis and we need your intervention. We cannot take bread at communion without thinking of the starving people caused by climate change. We cannot take the wine of communion without thinking of the thirsty people caused by climate change. We cannot look at the cross without thinking of those suffering pain because of climate change. We cannot hear words of peace without thinking of those living with war and violence. We cannot forgive others without thinking of those we hold grudge against. We pray as a church for the removal of the divisions in the world's wealth. We cannot look at the cross and forget that Jesus calls us to live a life of peace and harmony with others. We pray for peace, love and friendship for all those who are ignored by the majority and for those mentioned in this prayer. We ask for forgiveness for all those the things we cause but do nothing about. Not for ourselves but for our children and grandchildren. Father God, we pray for the hungry, the thirsty, those caught up in wars, those we hold a grudge against and those who live divided lives, but also for those who live in peace and who hold peace as their prayer and motivation and who work tirelessly for the peace and love among your people. We pray for those close to home, for those maybe in this congregation. We pray for those who need to feel your presence at this time. And just have a moment of silence when we think of those who desperately need our prayers. Father, we thank you for all that you do for us. And also pray for your presence in the world, and your presence in this area to grow and grow so that all of us can hear and believe in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn is number 470. Lord for the years.
priorities, that we will live for you alone. Lord, for ourselves in living power we make us, self on the cross and Christ upon the throne, the past put behind us, for the future take us. Lord, of our lives, help us live for you alone. And we share the grace together. The grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all.